a good morning all of your attention all seated so welcome all of you to this session uh morning we heard in during the inauguration about the importance of this cbdc competency based dynamic curriculum now when you say competency if you look at the four words competency based dynamic curriculum and go from backwards it is a curriculum and it is based on competency and it is dynamic so these are the three key features in the curriculum when we say it is competency based who who develops this competency what is important is who develops this competency naturally it is the students who develop the competency therefore if the students have to develop the competency the whole curriculum has to be focused on the learners and with this in the background when we have a curriculum designing a curriculum is like building a wall you have this wall on the screen just look at this wall all of your attention hello hello all of your attention please look at the screen there is a wall i'll show you one more some difference in the wall the way it is constructed you can see if there is a problem with the wall some day and you want to repair a particular part of it which wall will be easier to repair first or second first or second second why because it is structured there is some meaning that you can find in that and this structure and meaning has come because there is a plan behind that wall whoever has built that wall they, they have some plan behind that similarly the curriculum also whatever we are talking it there is a plan behind it so therefore if you want to have a dynamic curriculum the second it has to be the second kind of uh, uh, curriculum and there is a decided planning which has gone behind it the one of the major focus of the planning is that the curriculum is learner centric learner is the focus of all educational activity whatever is the curriculum is it focuses completely on the on the learners now if the learner is the focus of all educational activity we have two models of teaching learning one is a model where you can see that the teacher is force feeding the learner as you can see in a petrol pump where the petrol is being filled similarly knowledge is being filled into the learner that is one model now we have one more model where the learner is getting support from the from the teacher from some elder from some mentor to make the learner as the focus of activity learning activity which of these two models will be appropriate first or second first or second second therefore the focus of competency based curriculum is that learner is the focus to make learner as focus to make learner can you hear no okay to make learner as the focus we need to have the model where that learners is being supported the teachers are supporting the learners therefore we now understand in this session what is education as a system by the end of this session you will be able to define education as per the world health organization you will discuss what are the components of you will recognize that there is something called as bloom's taxonomy of learning and uh, what are the different levels of learning according to gilbert you will be able to map what is the priority of learning a state what are the features of a specific learning objective and state what are the components of a specific learning objectives so these are the objectives that I have set for this particular session 
when you look at this screen the seven statements each of the statement has something which is common for them which is common among them one of the commonality is that each of you who is present here will be able to perform this by the end of this session in fact we will come back and uh, revisit this slide by the end of the session each of you will be able to perform it therefore it becomes learner centric the learners are the focus of activity in this the second thing that you can see here is each of this first word is a verb it's an active verb so each of the statement can measure and observe what is being done what is the activity that is being done so looking at this this is the way we need to uh, present our curriculum more clearly so what the learner will be do, able to do at the end of the learning session with this in the background let us move further and see what is the definition of education education is defined as a continuous process you can see two words there one is continuous the other is process it is not a product product is something which will happen as a kind of end activity that is at the end of this you will have a certificate at the end of this you will have a degree or qualification but learning doesn't stop there it is something which is continuous and it is not a product it is a process so learning or education is a continuous process which has a goal or a purpose what is the purpose of education the purpose of education is to bring about desirable changes in the behavior of learners on a relatively permanent basis to summarize this if the learners whoever is learning is starting with some kind of a basic activity or a basic knowledge or a basic skill if the learner by the end of the session or by the end of a learning activity shifts from the current position to a new position only then the learning would have happened if the learner stays in the same position then the learning would not have happened unless there is a change in the behavior the learning would not happen therefore when you measure your learners your when you are teaching after, at the end of teaching if you see that the students have the same problems same doubts same definitions then the learning hasn't happened learning would have happened only if they shift from the position to a different position now how does this learning happen how does this shift in the position happen it happens as a result of three major influences first influence is acquiring knowledge when the students acquire knowledge there will be some learning that is there will be a behavior change change in the behavior the change of behavior can happen if there is an acquisition of knowledge let me take one example here i told you earlier that you will be able to classify content or learning as as per bloom when you say bloom the word bloom generally the word bloom is seen to be associated with flowers blooming now we say that okay at the end of this flowers will bloom here but by end of this session when you understand that this bloom is not the flowers it bloom but it is one professor benjamin bloom who classified learning content into different uh, areas or different domains your behavior has changed because of acquiring the new meaning for the word bloom because of that acquiring of that knowledge your behavior towards the word bloom has changed bloom is not only the flower which blooms but also there is a person by the name bloom who has done something else so now you see how the behavior has changed because of the acquisition of some knowledge similarly by improving the skills when the skills improve even after that our behavior can change and definitely by developing an attitude when our values change when our uh, our attitudes change our behavior also changes so therefore to summarize education is a continuous process which has a purpose to bring about changes among the learners and these changes have to be desirable desirable means desirable for the society desirable for the profession and desirable desirable for their own uh, professional growth desirable changes in the behavior of learners because and these changes happen as a, as a result of three influences one is acquiring knowledge 
second is improving skill and third is developing attitude. This is a basic definition of education according to WHO. So going further, when you talk of education or curriculum, there are three, three components for curriculum. There are three pillars of curriculum. Now before I go into curriculum, let me clarify a difference between curriculum and syllabus. Because when we say curriculum or syllabus, these are seen to be synonymous. It means the same. But these are not the same. There is some huge difference between curriculum and syllabus. A curriculum is the constitution of a course. Just like any country has a constitution, a course also has a constitution. What this course constitution tells is, what is the duration of this course? What are the subjects to be taught in this course? Who is eligible to get admission into this course? Who is eligible to teach this course? How the assessment of the students will be done in this course? And who will conduct the assessment for this course? What will be the qualification awarded by the end of this course? All these come under curriculum. So curriculum is a regulatory part of a course. It is a constitution of a course. Syllabus is a list of topics that will be learned under a particular subject. So syllabus is the educational component. Curriculum is the regulatory part. Syllabus is part of curriculum. That is the difference. So syllabus is the educational part. Curriculum is the regulatory part. So this is the difference. Now this curriculum has three components or three pillars. There are three areas into the curriculum. One area is called as the learning objectives. What the students will be able to perform by the end of a session. What the students should be able to perform. Just like the objective seven statements that we saw at the beginning of this uh, session on the screen, these are called learning objectives. Now these learning objectives set the direction for the learners. Now how do these learning objectives are achieved? How do the students achieve these learning objectives? Is by way of teaching learning methods and media. There are some instructional activities which the teachers uh, organize and the students participate in that. These are called as teaching learning activities. Because of the teaching learning activities, the objectives have to be realized. Now after completing the teaching learning activities, you have to check whether the students are aware, whether the students know what is being taught, what they have learned. For that there is something called as assessment, student assessment. Student at assessment tells whether the students have achieved those objectives, whether their behavior has changed from a, a position A to position B or C. Now, these three components of curriculum are interconnected. You can see that the arrows which are marking are marking both the sides. That is to say, the learning objectives influence the way education, uh, the, uh, the instructional activities are to be selected. Let me give an example. Suppose you want the students to learn what is the definition of blood pressure. For that you can give a lecture. You can give a lecture and expect that the students will be able to define what is blood pressure. Let me take one more example. The students are able to uh, uh, wrap the cuff around the arm of a patient for uh, measuring the blood pressure. If the students have to wrap, if the student has to learn how to wrap the cuff around the arm, and we give a lecture on how to do that. What will be the what will be the uh, ability of the students to perform that? How effective will that lecture be for performing, for wrapping the cuff around the arm? Not much effective. Therefore, how would we teach generally how the students has to wrap it? Demonstrate. Demonstrate how to wrap the cuff. Now you can see here there are two objectives which are from a different perspective and because of the difference in the perspective, the teaching learning method has changed. Now let us look at the assessment. If the same definition of education, whether the student has learned definition of education, if you have to check, you may ask a question in the viva or you may ask a question in the theory and whatever the answer the student gives, it will give a measure of whether the student knows it or does not know it authentically. There is some authenticity in the way it can be understood. On the same way, if you want to check whether the student is able to wrap the cuff around the arm of his patient and you ask the student a question in the theory or in the viva 
to describe it. The student will describe it. But what is the guarantee that the students can really do it? Therefore, the way you would assess the student for that skill is asking the student to demonstrate either in the practical exam or in a clinical examination. Now, you can see that there is a difference in the way assessment is being conducted as a result of the nature of the objective. The nature of objective decides what is the, what is the instructional activity and what is the assessment activity. Similarly, the quality of teaching will influence the quality of assessment performance. So, this is how the curriculum is interrelated. In the sessions to follow, we will be exploring each of these components of learning objective, teaching learning methods, media and assessment methods in different sessions. And in this session, we are going to discuss more about the learning objectives. <clears throat> what you see on the screen is a heap of books. If you want to pick a book from here, how easy it would be? Okay, rhetorical question, it is not very easy to pick because the books are so haphazardly strewn around that it may not be possible to pick a particular book very easily. How would this make? Things would be easier here. The reason is that these are arranged, these are organized, these are simple, all those answers would come. But the main reason is there is a plan behind the organization. There is a plan behind stacking of the books in a particular order. So this plan is very important. And there are many planning tools in education which we are going to use to make your working easier. And it is these planning, these planning tools that have been used in the, in the designing of this CBDC curriculum. So any tool has to have its purpose served. So if you say there is a particular tool, that particular tool has to serve the purpose and it should have some features for serving that purpose. Similarly, because we are now looking at the learning objectives, how the learning ob objective should be, what is the purpose of a learning objective. The first purpose is the learning objectives are student directed. We started with the statement that learner is a focus of all educational activity. If the learner has to be the focus of all educational activity, the direction that we set has to be learner centric. Therefore, the objectives that we state by the end of the session, you will be able to, you meaning the student or the learner, you will be able to perform this, do this, know this or whatever, acquire this is what is student directed. The statement itself says what the student will be able to perform. And you will see abundance of these statements in the CBDC curriculum in a particular column. You have the objectives column in that you can see many of these objectives. The second feature is that these objectives tell, shift the emphasis from what to how. It, they don't just tell what the student will be able to perform. They also tell how the student will be able to perform because there is a quality component in that. The third, the, the third feature of these objectives is quite interesting. What you can see here is of course a railway track. Now this railway track is a half, it is not complete. Now if we complete, you can see this is what has happened. Why it happened like this? The reason is the person on the left and the person on the right, they have no communication. They have not told how we are going to align. That is why this misalignment has happened. And it is this misalignment that you will see in the examinations. When the students write in the, sit in the examination and the question paper comes, this is what they come across. Because as a teacher, I would have told this is important, this is important, this is important from my perspective. And the person who said the question paper would think this is important, this is important, this is important. And when the question paper comes, the person said the paper and when I teach, hello, 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 yeah. please concentrate here. So when the student looks at the question paper, teacher has to start in a particular way and the per person who has said the question, he has taught in a particular way and he comes, comes across this kind of a situation. And more tragic things will happen when the paper goes for valuation and the person who does the valuation is also a teacher and who thinks this is important. Therefore, because of this miscommunication, there is a lot of, uh, you can say, confusion that happens. 
to improve this if you have the objectives being written and these objectives are being shared with all the teachers with all the examiners with all the students with all the paper setters then there will there will be no no miscommunication so it improves communication this is one of the major features or major reasons why we need to have the objectives written very clearly now when we say the objectives one of the tools that is used to write the objectives is called bloom's taxonomy bloom is professor benjamin bloom as i mentioned earlier benjamin bloom was uh, the president of american psychological association who took up the project to classify content into the learning content into different areas and they finally said that the entire learning content can be classified as three zones or three areas one area is called cognitive domain cognitive domain is where we learn by thinking or remembering or making a decision the second zone they said is called a psychomotor area psychomotor is where we use our hands and fingers to perform something any skill that is being performed is called psychomotor domain and the third area they said is it relates to something which is attitude or value or communication and it is called as affective domain please note the spelling it is affective not effective or affection there is no affection in that it could be something which is distasteful also so affective domain to give a simple a measure of how to identify the statement as cognitive affective psychomotor is when you come across any statement please think what is happening within you which part of your body is getting activated if your brain is getting activated you are thinking what is this you are recalling what is this what to do with this how to do what to do so when your brain becomes active that is cognitive domain when you read a statement and you perform that you are using your hands and fingers that becomes psychomotor domain and when you read the statement it makes you feel something good or bad about it or when you want to speak out that that becomes affective domain now let us see some examples one of the competency this you will see in the cbdc also the competency is measure the blood pressure of a person if the student has to measure the blood pressure blood pressure of a person which is a competency to perform this competency there will be multiple objectives or multiple steps to define blood pressure which domain does it fall into when you look at this statement when you read the statement which part of your body gets activated the thinking so it becomes cognitive domain so there is a cognitive domain wrap the cuff firmly around the arm if the student has to perform this the student has to use his hands and fingers to do this so it becomes psychomotor domain to relieve the anxiety of the subject before measuring blood pressure now to recognize that a person response from you psychomotor so the second statement state the 26 aphorism of arganan this would be cognitive very good hand the child gently during examination affective i also heard psychomotor okay no it could be there is some kind of a confusion whether it is psychomotor or affective because the word gently is there it is touching your feeling that i have to be gentle therefore you would have thought it is uh, affective domain suppose that word gentle was not there handle the child during clinical examination that would be that would be say you don't know anything can happen because you can't presume anything therefore one more lesson in the writing of the state as clearly as possible what do you expect the student to perform without any ambiguity without any confusion therefore if you want it this in the affective domain state it in the affective domain prepare liquid dose of 20 millisml potency prepare will be psychomotor domain 
list key mind symptoms of thuja from memory cognitive how to prepare ors explain communication so this will be affective domain suppose the statement was explain how to prepare ors two mother is not there explain how to prepare ors if that was there that would be cognitive domain because it is not communication it is only knowledge explain explain to a mother or to your father whoever it is it is communication so it becomes affective domain please remember this statement i will revisit this in another context a little later describe the process of decantation that domain okay thank you all when we look at the bloom's taxonomy you have seen that the content is organized into cognitive affective and psychomotor but in reality the content will not be at a flat level that everything is at one level there are different is how you would plan your teaching to your students you cannot just go directly to make your student take a decision there is a process which is involved there is a continuum which is involved and that is what we will see in the gilbert hierarchy now before i go into gilbert hierarchy let me also uh, clarify here that there is something called as bloom's taxonomy of levels bloom's taxonomy of learning we have seen which is cognitive affective psychomotor there is also bloom's levels of learning which are six levels of learning from the lowest to the highest in the cognitive domain and some other authors have classified learning of cognitive for affective and psychomotor at five levels and seven levels now what happens in this is this six levels five levels seven levels it creates a kind of confusion therefore who in its wisdom has clarified classified the entire learning of the different domains at three levels one entry level one intermediate level one higher level that is what gilbert has done and this gilbert hierarchy is the one which is extensively used in health professionals education if you search on google you can see that there are six levels in the bloom's taxonomy of Uh, cognitive domain but do not get into that kind of confusion because it is not easy for us to for all the medical teachers to adopt it writing all those statements at different levels writing at three levels is easier therefore it is advisable that we adopt this and the cbdc uh, document also adopts the same gilbert's levels so we will stick to gilbert's level what it says is cognitive domain starts with the simple recall or remember if you want to learn something in the or if you want to teach something to your students about knowledge the first thing that the students have to learn is to recall certain data first recall once they are able to recall certain data then they will interrelate that different data points to understand or interpret let me give an example same blood pressure the student is able to recall the normal range of blood pressure one data point student remembers what is the normal range of blood pressure now the second data point is student has measured blood pressure of a subject now what is the value in this particular subject two data points that is recall level now going to the next level understand or interpret to say whether the person whose blood pressure is measured is normotensive hypertensive or hypotensive the student correlates the two sets of data the normal range and the value in this person and interprets whether it is normotensive hypertensive or hypotensive that is the way learning happens from simple recall to relating the recall to understand and only when the student is able to understand he or she can take a decision that whether you have to send it for treatment or i have to give some what is the decision that has to be taken so the decision is based on the understanding or interpretation decision cannot be taken on recall or remember the problem solving is the next level or decision making these these are the three levels in which learning happens in cognitive domain the implication of this is when you are planning a teaching in a cognitive domain you have to begin from the recall level for your students then make them to understand or interpret then enable them to take the decision this is the 
flow of learning in cognitive domain. In the psychomotor domain, which is the skill learning, some performance, skill performance, the student will be able to observe and imitate what the teacher does. You have to demonstrate to the students, this is how you have to wrap the cuff around the arm. So the student observes and imitates. Imitation is, he has to know all the steps of performance. The second level is, once he is able to do the imitation, he is to perform it under control, under the control and the supervision of the teacher. The teacher is observing and the student is performing it. And when the control happens many times over, it becomes automatism. They can perform it independently. So this is, you cannot expect the student to perform independently at the first step. Demonstrate, they observe, imitate, learn under control and then the automatism will happen. Similarly, in the affective domain, if the student has to understand how to be gentle with the patient during case taking or when dealing with a patient, how to be gentle. That first level is to receive, to be open that there could be some anxiety with the patient, there could be some confusion with the patient or whatever. So first is to receive, receive is to be open. If there is no openness, receiving will not happen. So first thing is to receive. Second is to respond appropriately. What is the appropriate response to that? When the student sees the patient is anxious, how does the student respond to an anxious patient? Responding. And when this receiving and responding happens over a period of time, it becomes internalized. This is the way affective domain, communications and values are learnt. Now to give an example, from the homeopathic context, define common symptom is at the level of remember or recall. Differentiate between common and uncommon symptoms is at the interpretation or understanding level. Evolve totality of symptoms is at the decision making level. Now you can see to evolve totality of symptom, the student has to understand to understand the student has to recall. This is the step way of learning. To give an example in the affect psychomotor domain, observe the teacher for the sequence of auscultation. How the teacher does the auscultation for breath sounds is observation and imitation. Second is to perform auscultation under the supervision of the teacher with the guidance of the teacher. Second level. And third level is perform it independently, which is automatism. Now you can see how the maturity is going up. And for the affective domain, listen to the patient with empathy during case taking, receiving. Responding would be, respond to the anxiety of the patient if necessary. That is responding. And the internalization is, Recognize the anxiety of the patient before taking case. That you recognize that the patient might be anxious. The patient is not telling. Nobody is telling you. And you are directly responding at that level. Now to respond at that level, internalized level, you need to have the students develop receiving appropriate responding and then this becomes internalized. So this is the way the learning has to be organized. And this is the way the content has been organized in the CBDC also. You can see one column under Gilbert where it is said cognitive lower level, cognitive and intermediate level, psychomotor lower level, psychomotor higher level. All these things are very clearly written so that it becomes easier for you to relate. When you look at the content, the whole content is classified under three areas of priority for learning. Priority for learning is how important is this? content so this is the priority of learning how important is this learning for the professional performance the whole professional performance is by the end of this whole course of bhms the student will become a basic homeopathic doctor or a primary care homeopathic physician. 
that is what is the outcome that you require that you require so my doubt is like i am taking the case and i have to be open minded with my patient i should not be prejudiced whether he is anxious or whether he is worried now that doubt is uh, to educate student i should take care of my patient that is valid point but i should be open minded in taking a case i should not be prejudiced that my patient is worried and you were remedy based upon that point now how to take care of this because we have a doctor inside and we have a teacher inside so to control both how to manage okay now before we go into this there is a small doubt uh, that we have a dual personality of being a doctor and a teacher how do we balance it right first thing is to be aware that we have this dual personality that you are a doctor also and you are a teacher also and when you are playing that role are you playing the role of a doctor or a teacher now with the student when you are demonstrating to the students are you a doctor or are you a teacher you are both but there is a primacy that you have to give for that particular role in that context in the con in the given context when you are training your students primarily you are a teacher and background you are a you are a doctor your whole purpose is your audience not not you that is what we say learner is a focus of all educational activity the focus is what this learner will be able to achieve from this interaction so this interaction is for making the student capable of performing something empowering that person to perform something so you have to suppress your urge to become a doctor there and let lose your capacity of a teacher to take over that also comes under the same the affective uh, sorry affective domain where you are aware that in this context i am a teacher that is the receiving part of it and how do you respond to that see this whatever we are talked whatever we talk of this uh, affective psychomotor psych and uh, domains and levels are up, as much applicable to us as to the students we have to internalize those things also yeah good that you brought it because that could be one of the doubts which many teachers had but they did not express he expressed it and for their benefit thank you your good name sir okay thank you now when we have the content there has to be some prioritization whatever you bring into the content into the syllabus is not equally important or equally significant there is something consideration we decide what is the uh, priority of that learning so depending on the priority of learning we call it must know which is essential for a professional performance which is 70% of entire content then there is something called as desirable to know 20% of the content would can happen better in a better way some that that becomes desirable to know and another 10% which is nice to know and this is something which we feel happy that i know it doesn't have any importance for the professional performance to give example must know discuss the significance of doctrine of analogy in boning hassan's philosophy if the student doesn't know doctrine of analogy to the full extent his application of boning hassan's philosophy would not be successful they cannot use boning hassan's philosophy successfully without knowing the doctrine of analogy so it is must know so to add value to this doctrine of analogy if the student can explain what is the role of gestalt principles how does gestalt principle relate to the doctrine of analogy it adds value to that understanding and the nice to know is when was boning hassan's therapeutic pocket book published 
or who published Boni Gassan's therapeutic pocket book. What does it matter when it was published, who published it, if we have to use the therapeutic pocket book? It doesn't matter. It's only that I know something extra. For my professional performance, what I require is must know and desirable to know. And the implication of this in the assessment is 80% of the assessment theory, practical, viva is drawn from must know, 20% is to be taken from desirable to know. Much of the time we don't draw anything from nice to know. But in the viva, we have seen it is nice to know which takes precedence. Like for example, how many marriages Hanuman had, how many children Hanuman had, all these things will become uh, more important in the viva and that decides the fate of the student. Right. So, these are to be carried in our mind. Now, the next level is how do we organize the content into the whole course? We have the program objective, you would have seen in the CBDC document, there is something called as program objective. Program objective is after completing BHMS, what the student will be able to do. The second level in that is course objective. Course objective is about each of the subjects or each of the departments, what the student will be able to perform by the end of completing a course in a particular subject, like after completing anatomy, what the student will be able to perform. And within the course, there is something called a specific learning objective, which are part of each of the course. Now, to give an example, develop understanding of gross anatomy to recognize deviations from normal will be the program objective at the end of BHMS as a result of learning anatomy. Now, at the end of learning anatomy, the student will be able to identify the osteology of human skeleton in both gross specimen and in the medical imaging. This becomes course objective. Then you have specific learning objectives like demonstrate anatomical position is a specific learning objective. List the bones and axial skeleton is a specific learning objective. Now, you can see that the program objective is based on or drawn from course objective and the course objective has lot of influence on what the learning has to be in the specific learning objective. This is the way in the, uh, the way the objectives are organized. Now, when you say objective, specific learning objective, there are some features. One is it has to be relevant. To say whether it is relevant or not, ask a simple question. Does the BHMS student require this? Is it must know, desirable to know, nice to know? If you say yes, then it is relevant. For example, let us take the example of uh, explain to a mother how to prepare ORS. One of the objectives we had discussed earlier, explain to a mother how to prepare ORS. Is it necessary for a BHMS student to be able to perform this? Say yes, it is relevant. Now, let us to look at the second object, second feature, valid. You have to explain whether it is valid. To say va valid, technically, is the activity and the statement in the same domain. We have three domains, cognitive, affective, psychomotor. The activity and the statements are on the same domain, it becomes valid. To take an example, explain to a mother how to prepare ORS. Please listen carefully, this is very important. All of your attention on this. Explain to a mother how to prepare ORS. Now, if you go back to the domain, the statement is written in what domain? Affective domain. Explain. Communication. It is in the affective domain. And the activity is in which domain? What is the activity? Preparing ORS. Preparing ORS is in which domain? Psychomotor. Now, what happens here is, the activity is in psychomotor domain, but the statement is given in affective domain. So, there is a mismatch. This is not valid. To make it valid, because the activity is in the psychomotor domain, the statement also must be in the psychomotor domain. Therefore, we will have to rewrite it as, demonstrate to a mother how to prepare ORS. Then it becomes valid. Because the activity and the statement are both in the same domain. So, this will be the valid thing. The next things are very easier. It has to be clear. The statement has to be clear because the objective will, is going to become the question tomorrow. Whatever you write as objectives, the same objectives will become questions. Objectives or competencies will become questions. 
therefore if the objective is not clear the question will not be clear tomorrow therefore the clarity has to be there and this clarity will come when you add the verb to that when you add the active verb let me give an example here i am i know i am little dragging here a bit uh, little little bit but this is very important to know because this is the base for all your further activities uh, a few years back in uh, one of the universities in the mbbs uh, course anatomy there was a question for three marks the question was first rib first rib now what does the student answer for this in for three marks generally for three marks we say in three minutes the student can complete that answer of uh, three marks but here the question is three the uh, first rib there were many teachers of anatomy for that uh, student one teacher expected you have to draw and label one teacher wanted you have to explain the clinical anatomy because that is most important you are going to be doctor clinical anatomy is very important one teacher was telling it is very important to understand what is the ossification now the student has a kind of complete confusion what should i not write not what i should write what should i avoid because if i don't draw one teacher gets angry if i don't explain ossification another teacher will say this is zero if you don't read clinical anatomy the third person will say zero so the student ends up writing all for three marks the student would have spent 10 minutes this is what is clarity suppose the question was draw and label first strip was there any confusion for anybody or explain the clinical anatomy of first strip any problem so this is what is clarity if it is clearly stated the question becomes clear okay. and it has to be feasible to perform feasible is can the student really do this activity one thing is is it at the level of undergraduate or at the postgraduate level and is there any risk in performing this generally there is no risk in whatever we talk of here and the other two are demonstrable and observable measurable the activity which we say has to be demonstrable and measurable when you add the verb it becomes both measurable and act and observable so these are the features of a specific learning objective when you see a specific learning objective check whether it has these six elements if all the elements are there it is an excellent specific learning object and what are the components of a specific learning objective one is there should be an act or what is that you expect the student to perform say for example measure blood pressure measure is the act then there is a content content is what do you expect the student to perform measure the blood pressure blood pressure measurement is the content now what is the condition now, when you say condition again your doctor and teacher will get dual personality when you say condition you think of a disease it's not a disease here it is a situation context or enabler that is the condition measure the blood pressure using sigma manometer using sigma manometer becomes the condition what is the context what is the way in which you are doing it and this is a task to complete it what is the criterion what is the level to which level of perfection say for example measure the blood pressure of a patient using sigma manometer without causing anxiety to the patient the without causing anxiety becomes the criterion right this becomes a complete specific learning objective and when we are talking of the objectives you also have to think of the audience who is your audience whom are you talking to there are some features which are unique for the adult learners one is the adult learners there could be some learners who are visual learners when they learn they will learn better when they see something happening visually something is represented so visual learners are there uh, this is one of the learning theories there are about another 70 learning theories i'm only talking of two learning theories one is this is called as wark learning theory v a r k v for visual a for auditory there are some learners who learn when they hear something you could have seen people reading out loudly when they are learning causing disturbance to others so these are auditory learners and there are some people who have to read and when they read they have to write they make notes when they are writing so these are read write type of learners and the fourth is called kinesthetic learners 
are tactile learners who can learn only when they do something. You might have seen some students in your own class whom you think are very dull in the classroom because they don't pay attention, they don't answer any question. But when you take them to the laboratory, into the dissection hall, the, the kind of work they do would be wonderful. And you are struck wonder, like, how well they are doing. These are the kind of people who are kinesthetic learners. So, visual, auditory, read, write, kinesthetic learners. These are the four types. And in that, audio and visual learners are about 90%. So, uh, safely you can presume that 90% of your students in the class are with you for whatever you are talking and showing. And maybe about 7% need some laboratory assistance of tactile learning. So, whoever is not learning, you have to identify what is the profile of this learner so that you can support them in another way of learning. The second way of uh, understanding the learners is that adult learners, there are some features, they will learn, like for example, all of you are adult learners and you will learn if you need to know, if you feel this is necessary, if you feel this is not necessary, you will not know. Now, how to make the students to know what is necessary? When you demonstrate to them, these are the professional competencies that you require to become a successful person by the end of the course and for these competencies, this learning is related. And that is how the CBDC is organized. What is a competency? What is a content? What is the objective? What is the learning? How, what is the assessment? Everything is there in a single table. So, need to know. You have to demonstrate to them what is the need for this knowledge. The second is, each learner has a self-concept. I already told you they could be auditory learners, visual learners, kinesthetic learners. They know what is their strength of learning and you have to support that strength of their learning. Third is, each learner comes with experience and this is very important. All adult learners have some experience. Even those students who come first year for BHMS have some understanding from zoology about anatomy, uh, from botany into, uh, into pharmacy. There is some basic knowledge which they already have and they build on that. So you have to recognize and respect that experience. In fact, when you come to the lesson planning, there is some content, there is some concept called as entry behavior assessment which is assessing what the students already know so that you can build on that. And the fourth is readiness to learn. On a lighter note, students become ready to learn when there is examination. Therefore, in CBDC, we have continuous assessment. There is an assessment which is continuous so that the students are learning continuously. Just a kind of, uh, uh, a, kind of a joke. But readiness to learn is where you make the students uh, on their toes for their learning uh, because learning cannot happen just before the examination, the final examination. That's only uh, learning by heart. But here learning for their professional growth has to be continuous. And the orientation to learn is something which is holistic. We have anatomy separate, physiology separate, biochemistry separate. But when the patient comes, the patient doesn't come with a separate anatomy or physiology. They come with the whole thing. Therefore, that learning has to be something which is holistic and that is what is taken care in the last column in the CBDC called integration. The relevant aspects of anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, materia medica and all the other subjects are integrated so that that learning happens in an integrated manner. That is orientation to learn. And the last is motivation to learn. Now, the motivation could be extrinsic because of the examination. But what is important and self-sustaining is the intrinsic motivation which happens because they feel this is important to learn and that you can show what is the need to know. What are these objectives and how do these relate to their future success? That is what is motivation. Now, by the end of this session, these are the objectives that I had listed at the beginning. Are you able to define education? discuss components of curriculum as learning objectives, teaching learning methods and assessment methods, recognize the Bloom's domains of learning as cognitive affective psychomotor, describe Gilbert's level at three levels in each of the domain, prioritization of learning as must know, desirable to know, nice to know, and the features of specific learning objective as the six components and the four components of each specific learning objective. If you are able to even understand or recall 10% this is successful. 
because in learning and development there is a concept called 70 20 10 you learn only 10% in a formal situation if your students go out of bhms just by sitting in the classroom and attending the clinicals nothing more then they are only 10% fit but if you enable them to have interactions among themselves and with the teacher beyond the formal classes informally that will add 20% and if you can give them a, a facility of learning on their own reflecting and learning that will add 70% so this cbdc also takes care of not only the 10% of formal learning but also the 20% of interaction because there are some small group activities and individual learning because there is individual activities so that almost 100% they should be ready if the cbdc is implemented properly with this thank you all for this session i will revisit you after a gap no dr dharmendra he will take up the next session thank you principal professor in hod department of forensic medicine and toxicology dr dy patel homeopathic medical college and research center pune maharashtra he'll be guiding us on the topic of teaching learning methods good afternoon everybody we just had uh, discussion when munir sir was taking the lecture as to uh, you know is a doctor a teacher so many times we assume that doctor is a teacher only when the setting is a classroom but that's not true because doctor is a teacher the day he becomes a doctor because the word doctor itself is derived from this latin word which says to teach so doctor when he becomes a doctor he is born to teach actually so who are these students it's not necessary that a doctor who is not into academics is not teaching because he is a teacher to his patients so he teaches them everything about good health if you read the actual meaning of the word dossier it means uh, learning from the books of nature and teaching the students teaching his patients so doctor is a teacher in his clinic also and he is a teacher in the classroom also and a doctor who get, who is fortunate to become a teacher in a college also has got a dual responsibility that in his clinic he teaches his patients and in the college he teaches his students so doctor is always a teacher you cannot become a good teacher without becoming a learner you all are uh, professors who have 10 years 20 years 30 years experience behind you and still you are here today for this cbdc training so today you are here as a learner and so this learning is going to help you to teach whatever you have been teaching in a little more better way in a more little systematic and in a more organized way so we'll start with our topic uh, which is describe the common uh, at the end of this session you will be able to describe common instructional settings with the merits and demerits of each of the teaching learning method is there any college amongst you who have undergone uh, nac accreditation or preparing for nac anybody amongst the audience who has gone in for nac accreditation okay so if you had gone in for nac accreditation or rather prepared for it you would understand the importance of different teaching learning methods which you have to undergo in your college because every different teaching learning method carries different marks so we'll also learn about how to classify the teaching learning methods according to the group size we'll also categorize the teaching learning methods as per the domains of learning and we'll also be listing the salient features of the non lecture methods like problem based learning group discussions etc now is there anybody amongst you who uh, teaches students in some different way other than taking lectures every day in the classroom is there any teacher amongst you who takes some different method to teach the students anybody you can share with us since we are in a discussion type of an interactive audience yes anybody who takes something other than a lecture when you enter the classroom you start with your lecture so you are the focus you have decided that this is what i am going to teach the students and the teach students are supposed to learn this at the end of the lecture so do you does, has anybody thought from the student point of view because now the education has shifted from the teacher centric method to now the student centric method so what the student wants 
so we may have to all diff, you know we may also have to change our teaching method into something what the student actually wants in the class because with whenever you take a lecture when you start a lecture the students are attentive in your class for only up to 20 25 minutes after 25 minutes their mind starts wandering to other places and then they come back to you when you are concluding your lecture so your essence of your lecture has to be in this 25 minutes so if you have a one hour class don't expect your students to be attentive to you for one hour even if i am going to talk to you you are going to be with me only for 50 percent of this lecture 50 percent you will be wandering your own day-to-day -day activities other things other things other things so i should be able to hold your attention for at least 30 minutes so that is the essence of teaching we'll move on to the next part now now uh, is any of you uh, in your class when you come like suppose i was teaching forensic medicine so when i used to start my lecture i used to tell the students that uh, have you read the newspaper today so what was there was there any medical legal case in the paper because every day in the paper you have some murders you have some suicides you have something in the class this was just to generate the interest in the students so the students automatically started reading the newspaper and uh, suppose if today i was to teach uh, sexual offenses and there was a case of sexual offense in the paper today they would have read that case and then they come to me so the theoretical class which i am going to take has got a practical implication because the student knows is going to become a doctor and he needs to know about these sexual offenses so automatically he's generate, he uh, i have generated the interest in the student for this particular topic so we come to teaching learning processes traditionally i told you teachers played a dominant and an act, uh, active role and the students were assigned only a passive role of listening recently we hear all these new phrases like learning experience uh, and recognizes the active and dominant role of the learners in the process of education 